Well, we sort of entered the film um, after one edit had been done. So, um, at uh, I, when we I first saw it, I saw the film in its entirety. So we uh, Anand then invited us uh, to watch the film. We watched the film through, and then we sort of um, there was already music in the film, so they edited it to certain pieces of music. And uh, some of them worked, in our opinion, some of them didn't. And we both, I think we were both, we both immediately understood what was working about the pieces that were there and what didn't. Anand wasn't very specific about anything in terms of a specific kind of instrumentation or, uh, um, you know, genre or way of approaching it. He knew what he didn't want the music to achieve in the film. In, philosophically, in terms of, or uh, in terms of just generally, what he wanted the film to mean, and what certain sections meant to him, and how he wanted to, what kind of emotional response he wanted to evoke in the viewer while they watched those sections. But there was no specific brief in terms of instrumentation or style. Uh, he didn't want to sort of make it exotic, you know, have a very Indian kind of feel just for an Indian, just to make it feel like an Indian film. I think he felt the film already achieved that, so he was open to anything, you know, in terms of uh, a musical approach. So as a result, our base was built most more on what we, the general role we felt music should play in the film, and the the sort of um, effect we wanted to to achieve. Uh, so I think Anand was big on a sense of scale, and um, you know he wanted to evoke this feeling of vastness and sort of serenity and journeys and things like that. So. Usually it's, I mean, I've worked mostly on independent cinema, you know, sort of small budget independent films. And it's always been, you know, I, I, it depends, it completely depends on also when you enter the process. Um, so certain films you've sort of been approached with a script. So you start composing music before anything has been shot. And then things are edited with maybe some scratches you've composed. Then of course, there's a, it's a very organic process of a back and forth. You know, I don't think there's any sort, any sort of rigid structure like what you were referring to of, you know, this happens and that happens and that happens. But usually, yeah, you do, um, it, if you enter in before, there's some sort of collaborative process where you come up with some music and that may or may not be used during the edit. And then you see a rough cut. And then, yeah, you sort of, there's a back and forth process while, you know, you compose music that can, could impact the edit or edit changes happen for some other reason and the music sort of has to work around a newer structure. It's a very fluid process. I think it changes completely from filmmaker to filmmaker and film to film. What actually happened in Sheep of Theseus? When these things happened in Sheep of Theseus and you... Yeah, I mean, we entered the film, I think, quite a long while after they had started. I mean, the process was quite long from in the inception of the script in the first place. I mean, the first time the script was written to when they started shooting to when the edit that we saw had already happened. But yeah, there were massive changes in the edit. The duration of the film changed completely. The structure of the film in terms of which story came first changed. Yeah, so, but we, what, what the general process is, we watched the rough cut with Anand, then we spotted the film. We sort of go through the film and you decide what music is needed where and where you don't want music and where you want music and what you want the music to achieve. Really. With the film, there were several ways we went to sort of, I mean, we, it was, a, it was a, again a process of dialogue as to how we achieved that. And we sort of went through different iterations of different things that we felt worked. But um, largely the score is com comprised of these sort of string harmonics, you know, played at a very high pitch. But they were sort of echoing into these very large, vast, reverb, reverberant sort of spaces. We sort of went about that in different ways, but it was sort of like these string harmonics and uh, things echoing into these sort of reverberant spaces. And it's also just in the sort of, it was a sort of textural approach to the score, which, um, yeah, we used, for example, what we, the, the way we started with was we have, we had an upright piano in the studio. So we sort of took, a, took apart the, the, the panels and exposed the strings and sort of held down the sustain pedal. And then the way you can get the strings to echo within the sort of rev, uh, the, the reverberance of the piano itself. We did a lot of sort of ex sonic experiments with that. Like, well, there's a sort of ambient layer that helps contribute to the sense of, you know, vastness or sort of the zoomed out kind of feeling that we wanted to achieve, uh, which we, we tied um, various bits of string, like viola strings and cello strings and bits of wool to the, the piano strings and uh, either and board those. So you sort of have those echoing uh, within the sort of the, the piano. And then we layered that in different ways. 
we had strings jumping across the ridges of the piano string so that's sort of these sort of sparks that echo into a reverb the piano itself so we sort of these various sort of experiments to try and achieve a sonic quality that would uh, evoke that sense of uh, vastness Yeah, I mean, my colleague Benedict Taylor, who also co-composed the, the the film Ship of Theseus, as well as whatever work we've done in the past, he comes from a sort of like tradition of sort of experimenting and and deconstructing an instrument and trying to see the various ways you can get sound of it out of it that it's not conventionally sort of um, used um, for. So yeah, even in Ship of Theseus, there's a kadai in the score. <laughs> a lot of the you hear these sort of bowls and these sort of reverberant things as well. And one of the we used like various pots and pans from our kitchens, filled with water without water that were bored. You get these sort of resonant sort of sounds from them as well. Um, and we in our previous scores we've used we've bored acoustic guitars and uh, sp spoons and forks on various kinds of strings and. I mean, yeah, you could go on the very, we try each time to sort of, you know, um, come up with some sort of unique uh, sonic signature for each sort of film. I think people are more open to sort of exploring, diff I mean, Anand was also very clear that with this film he wanted to not use a conventional sort of mode of telling a story with music, you know, and not have an orchestra or not have this, you know, these sort of very, these things that you're used to hearing in every kind of film. So I think everyone's trying to do that and find different ways in which they can sort of create a sonic landscape that works with whatever, or tells the story that they need to with each film. Um, with respect to ambient music and drones and stuff like that, we, that was, I mean, the, the score of Ship of Theseus does have a sort of very, there is one sort of, like I mentioned, that sort of piano ambient drone that's throughout and that sort of sonically links all the different stories together. Um, but yeah, that was just the sort of, the, 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 the mood that we felt worked best with the film. That sort of came more from what we felt the film was trying to achieve and say, uh, and not from any kind of fashion or change in sort of um, style or anything. See, I wouldn't agree with that completely. I feel Hans Zimmer's scores, for example, don't do that. Um, or the score for a film like a Harry Potter. I think each film sort of demands a specific kind of approach. So when you have these grand narratives, like most of what Hans Zimmer does, like say Batman or Superman or uh, Harry Potter, those films have very strong melodic themes and these big moments will have like music that you'll go out humming from the theatre or will sort of very state state its position in the film very clearly like now this is music and this is a scene that you want the music to clearly be very effective in while um, a film like Ship of Theseus didn't need that it was trying very hard to not be um, you know not be manipulative and say this is what you should be feeling here and this is what you should be feeling here and instead it, I think it wanted the music to sort of not be tautological in that you don't want in a specific moment the music to say exactly what everything else is already saying so there was a definite effort in that film and it was something Anand clearly really wanted to achieve that the music sort of stepped back and is sort of like a secret service or something you know it comes and does its job but no one knew it was there you know so it's sort of just guiding you along in the film and not trying to state its presence and say you should be feeling sad right now you should be feeling really happy right now that sort of just sort of gently guides you along with uh, what's already happening If you've seen the film, they all sort of, the three stories eventually come together and the film is not, it tries, I mean, it's very much about how you examine those stories against each other. So we were very clear that we didn't want a sort of separate sonic identity for each three or separate themes for each character. They all sort of, um, it's all part of one sort of organic whole. They, they don't sort of change I mean, thematically at least yeah, from one to the other. Bringing another musician in can breathe a lot of life into something that you've done because you have another perspective coming in. And the sound of a natural instrument in a good room is something that can't really be replicated with technology. But that said, there are a lot of things in technology that you can't do in with a with a real world instrument, you know. So I think it, it really depends on, you know, you, you uh, finding the right tool for the right job. 
kind of thing. Um, all the music that we've done for, most of the music that we've done for film has involved, whenever there's been an acoustic instrument that needs to be there, it, it is an acoustic instrument. We don't try and use a sampler. But for example, in Ship of Theseus, we built our own sampler for all the viola harmonics. So Benedict and I went into a studio and Benedict played all these various phrases. And then we built the sampler out of those phrases and that's how we constructed the score in a big way. So we had like 1,000, I think 1,900 unique phrases that we built a sampler in contact with, you know. So then I think there's a great, there are great possibilities for dialogue between those two things also. And there's no, it, it, it's, the dangerous thing about that is any idea of purity, you know, because you can, there's, there's so many crazy ways you can combine things right now that the possibility is almost endless. So. I've had the fortune of sort of, end, you know, working on. I think it's good. There's a. This is a. This is a really interesting time, as Andrew and I were talking about a little earlier. This sort of like uh, this transformation of the the scene here. These new sort of independent movies are coming out. These new voices are coming in. So to sort of connect with that, I guess, would be the best thing to do. And you know, in the beginning of of whatever you're doing, if do not worry so much about uh, making a career and getting like uh, big films to work on but try and find interesting you know like uh, projects that where you'll have a chance to sort of express yourself creatively you know follow your passion <laughs> which is a cliche but it yeah well my colleague um, Benedict has come from you know uh, we've, we've I've learned a lot from him um, and with each each film you sort of you know and people you meet and Films you watch, you know, there's there's a great, there's any, everything to, you know, things to draw from everywhere. But yeah, directors, you can learn a lot from the way a director approaches a certain scene and the way they sort of um, thought about something. Some, sometimes it can be really revealing and sort of like a curtain lifts and you're like, oh yeah, that's what you were trying to do. And you know, sort of each thing, you sort of become more sensitive to what someone's trying to, trying to do, which uh, I think each project sort of teaches you something. But there's these vast, vast... Uh, um, you know, sources of uh, knowledge on the internet, which I really indebted to, both in terms of learning how to use technology, as well as um, just you know, you can go on and there's forums or anything where composers are talking about their approach. Where you can go and see, find videos where people are deconstructing complex music harmony for you, or uh, talking about music history. I mean, there's there's we live in an age where information is everywhere, you know, so. It's amazing, yeah. No, I mean, the first concern obviously is like the film and how whether you're achieving the right kind of emotional um, sort of connection with the film and what your director is asking you to achieve with each scene. Uh, I leave the 5.171 and Dolby Atmos, that kind of stuff to a mix engineer because they, that's their sort of area of expertise. But in terms of technology like contact or learning new scripting in contact or new effects or reverbs or things that could inf influence the compositional process, yeah, definitely. I mean, you try and keep abreast with all the new things that are out there and things that could potentially change ways you could approach putting things together or things like that. Definitely. It's not like you give your tracks to a mix engineer and then you stand back and then you, the only time I hear the final mix is in the cinema. Mm -hmm. I, I'm there through the, or whoever's there is, is, I mean not negotiating, but it's a process of collaboration with the mix engineer because he's also hearing it for the first time and you need to sort of maybe communicate what you're looking to achieve. So you, that's a process of collaboration where whatever leaves the mix stage, uh, the pre-mix stage before it goes to the final mix is something that, you know, you're very clear about that's exactly how you wanted it to sound. So it's not like I, you hand the tracks to the mix engineer and then you hear it for the first time in the preview. The, there till the end of the final export of the mix. Because that can, that's such an important process, you know, to get the, just the right kind of balance or focus in terms of what, what, should, what should be foregrounded and not, what shouldn't. There's so many, I mean, I, I don't know. I really like um, some of Alexander Desplat's work. The, the French guy was doing a lot of work in Bollywood now, uh, Hollywood now. And uh, 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 I recently saw a film of his called Birth. And then he had another film, all of his music with Wes Anderson. He's even scored very commercial films like Twilight and Harry Potter. And each of them he sort of like 
he changes himself completely and he's he does some really interesting stuff yeah i love all the music from the 50s i thought that was like a golden really golden age you know where both the i i both the the arrangers and the musicians there there was such a rich quality to to the musicianship of all that all that work you know like rd berman and st berman and all of that stuff it's uh noshad and all of that 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 era is something that's you know really captivates me it's like really really amazing work yeah and i i love i when i first heard amit trivedi's music for uh, um dev di and i love ar rahman's i mean there's so many people i could keep list everyone and everyone's done something that's incredible so Yeah. These kind of things always run the risk of sounding very cliched but what I think Ranjit Bharat and like other people were talking about here was you know they usually create troughs and crests with your with work you know and you go through moments where there'll be long periods of nothing and so you just really love what you do and make that the absolute focus and maybe not get caught up with like trying to make a career and I want to achieve this by then and this by then but just focus on you know remembering that this is really what you want to do and you don't want to be an accountant you don't want to have this kind of bank balance this is your decision you've made so to follow that through and uh, you know there will be moments where there won't be anything for a while so mm. you would need to sort of build up build up that